<laughs> All right. Uh, we were talking about tables, and today we are going to talk about styling of tables and accessibility relating to tables, and then a few miscellaneous other table tags other than the big four that we had mentioned previously. Um, let's see, where to start? That's a good question. Let's start with a couple additional table tags. All right, couple additional table tags. Just to review, here is our basic table. All right. Um, rows and columns. The four basic table tags are the table tag itself, which goes around the whole table, as you might imagine. TRs, which indicate table rows. TDs or THs, which represent table headings or table data. All this is intertwined. I'm, I'm like trying to think of what's the best strategy. We'll do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We'll cover one new tag, and that's the caption tag. Caption tag sort of is a header for the whole table. So we could say something like average temperature in U.S. cities. And we do this for a couple reasons. Um, this will help a screen reader associate and, and, and give context to the, da the data instead of just getting a bunch of data all at once. Um, you're given a little bit of an explanation of what the data means. It's a tag within the table, so it goes with the table. All right, it's not a header that's outside of it that could be confused as being part of something else. So when we open this up in the browser, we see it appears sort of on the top of the page. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's leave the new tags and go back to talking about styling this guy. What we see now is sort of the default styling of the table. And it makes the table cells as big as they need to be. So the table columns are as big as the biggest piece of data in them. So the first column, Los Angeles is the biggest thing. So Los Angeles is what determines the width. For these three months, January, February, and March, um, they're the biggest thing, so they determine it. Notice a couple things. Um, the um, THs are centered, so city notice is centered over that. These are actually centered as well, but because they're the entire width of it, they take up the whole width of it. So centering really doesn't matter in that case. When we make those wider, we'll see the impact that centering has on that. Um, now, again, don't lie to your browser. If you decide that you don't want these centered, or don't want them bold, which are default behaviors of the TH, 
you don't make them TDs so that they're not centered and, and not bold. You simply change the style to make THs be not bold and not centered. All right. So use the tag that's appropriate and use styling to get it to look the way that you want it to. All right, first thing I think would be a good idea to do is to spread this table out a little bit because it's kind of cramped. And we can do that a few different ways. And out of laziness, I want to put the style sheet right in the HTML file. That is not an excuse for you to do that in assignments. You, you can, that's true. You could put the style right on there. That, that's one thing that I didn't talk about. Um, and now, now's, a, now's a good time to at least show that, all right? Because um, one option that you have, actually, one option I don't, didn't talk about much, um, but it is an option, is you can actually put the style right as part of the tag. So I could say style with. 600 px for example and that will make the style uh, that'll make the table 600 pixels wide generally speaking I avoid doing this simply because one of the goals in web design is having some sort of consistency and Therefore, I might want, if I had multiple tables on a page or multiple tables across my site, I may want a similar look to them, all right? And if I do it this way, I have to get that code right each time. And if I decide I want to change that look, I have to go and change it in every place. You would use this in the situation where you had one unusual thing on your site that you know that you don't want anything else to look like, that you want to style this in a very specific way, and you're not really concerned about the reusability of it. But you can do that, all right? And what you do is simply you, you write like the style rule there. You, you put that, um, you know, the, the name of the property, a colon, the value of the property, and then a semicolon. It's also useful, given the fact that styles cascade, to have all your CSS code in one place as well. So um, again, I'm not saying never use that, but be careful when, when you use that. Probably better than putting in an, uh, uh, an absolute number of pixels, though, would be to give a percentage. So I'm going to say with. maybe 60%, and then you can always supply a minimum width as well. Four hundred pixels, for example. And then it gets a certain size, and as the window changes its size, it resizes it. Now it's a little more obvious that those headers are um, centered because you know they're not so tightly packed together. Now notice we, we just put the width on the table. All right, we didn't say anything about the columns. If you put the width on the table, it sort of proportionally figures out how big to make the other ones. All right. So if you remember, when we had no style at all, city was the biggest column because Los Angeles was the biggest thing um, in any column. In, in, in any, uh, I, yeah, in any column. So notice now that the city column is wider than the three monthly columns. Now, I would say if you look at this, it's sort of confusing. Like if you were to look just at this, at this number here, is 20 January or February, all right? Because I only have three columns, it's sort of obvious that it's uh, February. But if I had a whole bunch of columns and I was way over here, it might not be obvious. So the centering uh, of the TH and TD kind of uh, aren't very good. So we could address this a bunch of different ways. One thing we could do is we could right align both the TH and the TDs. So I could say TH comma TD 
or I'll do this, TH, text align, right, and I can do the same thing for TD. Now that makes it a little bit easier to read. All right. You might want to do something to draw focus to the caption, and so you can style the caption. So I could say caption font size 1.5M, and maybe give it a different color. and that'll make that stand out. Um, I could give a, let's see, all the things you can do. Um, really, I'm not covering anything new with this. I'm just talking about using the stuff that we already know with relation to tables. So you can mix and match stuff. If I didn't want, the, if I wanted all the TH to, I'm sorry, if I wanted all the columns to be the same, I could do that by doing something like this. I could say THs with um, 25%. There's four THs, right? In, in, there's four columns. And therefore, I could say I want each of them to be 25%. And that will make the column size equal. Now, if you give impossible directions to the browser, the browser takes its best shot. For example, if I were to say with 45%, well, that doesn't make sense, right? I have four columns. How can each one of them be 45%? Um, you know, that's 180 or 90%, 180%. All right, so that's an impossible command for the browser to interpret. What does the browser do? Fortunately, the browser doesn't give you an error. It, it still does its best, and it just takes a shot at displaying it. So let's see what it will do in this case. It made the first one 45%, and it made the other, two, other three columns smaller. It looks like that's what it did. All right. Browsers are actually very clever, all right, in that um, if you say something that isn't, doesn't make sense, they won't completely freak out. They'll take a shot at doing what you wanted to do. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you can type absolutely anything in there, right? Uh, but it does mean that you're a little bit protected from yourself um, as far as um, making mistakes and giving invalid commands in. It won't crash, right? Yeah, it, 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 just, it just won't do what you maybe expect it to do. All right? Now, a couple things that you can do. You can put borders on things. All right? Let's put a border underneath THs. So what I want is I want there to be a line underneath this row. So I could say TH border bottom two pixel solid black. And that would give me that. If you notice, if you look real, real close, there's actually a little gap between there. Um, that can be bothersome. All right. Um, 
what you can do to fix that is say on the table, Border collapse, collapse. Again, don't blame me. I didn't make this up. And then that sort of got rid of the gap between the borders. We we'll go and put a width on the THs to make the table look a little more even. There the table's getting to look more of what I kind of had in mind. All right. We could do things to let the, we could do other things to let the header stand out. We could change the color of them. So I could say background RGB 200, 200, 200. And that gives a gray appearance to that. Um, if we have a long table, just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to go and duplicate these table rows a couple times, just so that we have a bunch of table rows in here. We can pretend they're different cities. Now we have a bunch of cities. Now, especially if the table was wider, this number here, your eye has a tendency to drift up or down. So that is, if I look directly across, that is Juno. But if I was reading a really wide table, my eye might drift up or down, and I might think it's Cleveland or Los Angeles. All right. So well, something new in CSS uh, 3 is CSS 4 alternate table colors. There we have alternating rows. Um, it might be a little hard to see. Um, I'll make it a little more obvious by making this a darker shade of gray. There, you should be able to see that. And that just helps your, your eye keep aligned. So if you're going, if you're moving this way, you can see that that 16 relates to Juno. All right. Okay. Let's see what else we have in our bag of tricks. Um, yes. I believe if you say table border 2px solid black that would do it so I put it just on the table tags
Now notice how we went from the beginning of class until now. We went from something that, you know, had the data in it um, and was really bare bones and, and didn't look good. And what's more, it was a little confusing to read to something like this, which is um, a lot, lot better, a lot easier to read and a lot more attractive as well. Let's see, did I have anything to say about styling? I think we're good on styling for now. Accessibility with tables. The accessibility issue with tables is similar to that with forms. In other words, we use our eyes for a lot of things that we don't even think about. So for example, 68. What does 68 mean? Well, we look up to see that it means February. We look across to see that it means Los Angeles. All right. We do that almost without even thinking. And a table is going to be linearized. What does linearized mean? Linearized means it's going to be read in a straight line. It's going to read city, Jan, Feb, Mar, Cleveland, 15, 20, 29, Juno, 1, 10, 16. As it's reading through that, it might become very confusing. Well, 16, what was that? Was that March or was that April or was that May or whatever? All right. What you can do, and this works with a lot of screen readers, is you can put in a scope attribute that points to the header that, that identifies something as being either a column or a row header. There's another way to do this, uh, to, to do accessibility, but I find this to be a lot more straightforward. So for example, if we look at this. City, TH of city, has a scope of a column. What that's really saying is that the word city is a column header. City tells you, city isn't, isn't the name of something. It isn't the name of a city or anything. Not like the city of Townsville or anything. All right. But it tells me that that is a column header. And we can do this for all of these. Likewise, we can do this with the row header. In this case, the city name is kind of like a row header. It tells us what that row is about. I'll get rid of all the extra ones that I added on. Now, this makes no visible change to the table. But for screen readers, it will help a screen reader as it's reading. A person will be able to identify what row it belongs to and what column it belongs to. Again, notice, nice little touch. Doesn't take but a couple minutes to go and add that in. Um, and yet, it will make a big difference for someone that's accessing this via a screen reader. Repeat that, please. Yes, it would just read it. And there probably would be like a function key or something that you could press that it would say what the, what the row and column header was. So if it read 29, there probably would be a function key that would read. Um, or maybe it would say Cleveland March 29. I, I'm not sure. It would depend on the specific screen reading software. But this is sort of the hook that would allow you to, 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 to use that. All right. If you don't do that, effectively you're doing things like, you know, 
uh, building uh, rooms with the, the door too narrow for people to get in. So people may have the assistive technology of a wheelchair, but they can't use it because the, the, the door is too narrow or something like that. By putting this in, you're, you're accommodating people that use, use that. All right. What else? All right, accessibility, CSS. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Um, other table tags. We'll talk about sort of advanced table things. Now, advanced table things, a lot of times are to be avoided, believe it or not, because you can make tables overly complicated and that makes them very hard to maintain and that can make them um, less accessible as well. We already talked about one thing where we, have, we can have a row span or a column span where one table cell takes two, two places in the table. All right, That's one thing that we talked about um, that you can do. In the old days, we would nest tables within tables. Wow, that was a mess. All right. So for example, just as a dumb example, we could have for Cleveland for January, we could have a little mini table that showed the high and low. I don't even know why I'm typing this in other than a little bit of nostalgia for myself. You have a table inside a table, nested tables. Um, and we could do that for every TD that we have for a city and month. Um, generally speaking, avoid that. That would be better if you broke it up into two tables. Maybe you had a high table and a low table. Or if you did want to combine it in a table, have a whole separate row for high and low. So I have a Cleveland high row and a Cleveland low row. This is a nightmare of maintainability. If you change anything, it becomes so difficult um, to get everything right. And if you miss a tag, um, it will really look ugly on certain browsers, uh, uh, et cetera. So avoid doing that. I, again, I don't even know <laughs> why I showed you uh, that. But um, just say no to nested tables. Just say no, yeah. Uh, from an accessibility perspective, they're a nightmare. And from a ma programming maintenance perspective, they're a nightmare. Um, usually, if you keep it simple, um, you're better off. Even with the TD that spans two columns, you're, you might be better off just like if something had the same value you know, for two columns, you might, um, you might be better off just um, duplicating the data. Um, keep in mind. Um, a lot of times tables are generated by server-side scripting, which means that some of this code that I'm putting in that might look tedious to you, you know, um, actually you're going to write a program to generate this code, and it's not as tedious as you might, might think it would be. Right. Um, another uh, set of table tags which uh, can be useful are the T-head, T-body, and T-foot. 
Those have accessibility connotations and they also have styling connotations. For example, I could put T head around my row of headers. T body around my row of my rows of the body. And then, if I had like totals or averages, so I don't know if it really makes sense for temperatures, but if I took an average of these cities' temperatures, I could put those in a T-foot tag. It won't look any different. But I could put some styling on it. So I could say T-foot. Color blue. And again, for accessibility reasons, if I make something a different color, I will want to um, also um, change it some other way. So maybe I'll make it bigger font. Font size 1.2M. So it stands out that way. Remember, that's a rule of accessibility um, that um, you use multiple presentations. So in the case of if you're going to use color as an indication of something, do something else. All right? Do something else instead. I could make alternating roles in italics if I wanted or use a different font. What? I don't know. Some of those are goofy. But... Um, Again, colorblind, uh, even people that are colorblind could probably see the gray versus the white. So I don't think um, that would really be an issue um, in this case as far as colorblindness goes. Again, remember, if you see old examples or if you've done coding in the past and you've used tables for layout, do not continue to do that. All right? Um, that was a practice that was done back before CSS was widely uh, implemented in browsers, and we avoid that now. All right, um, this is going to be a really rare day in that I'm going to end early. But before I end early, I do want to talk about what we're going to be doing the, the last part of class, because we have three weeks left. Is that correct? Yes, we have three weeks left. Um, we will. I will, number one, I will give you some time to work in class on your project. All right, so there may be some days where we have a all lab day, where we just go up to the lab and work on it. It's important that you take advantage of those because, again, if you run into questions, you can ask me right then and there. But it's important for another reason, too. Um, I encourage you to, look, to, to ask someone in lab, like, what they're working on and what it looks like, all right? Because you can get ideas from what they're doing. And you can ask them, gee, how did you get those alternating rows in your table if you, don't, if you weren't here today, if you don't remember? And, you know, most people would be glad to share um, their techniques. And you can get some ideas of stuff to do and, and so on. And, and generally, it's just a good idea. It's a good idea to sort of share what you've done. And you can get feedback from people as well, all right? Um, so... For part of, uh, so there probably will be one or two sessions where we um, simply are going to work on our, our, any remaining assignments that you have and the project. The rest of the time will be, will, be, um, will be taken up by doing stuff concerning JavaScript. What is JavaScript? JavaScript is a way to change a page without reloading the entire page. All right? 
And you can do some really cool things with JavaScript. Um, there's, there's a few examples of it. Probably a good one would be something like this, where Notice that the page is loaded. As I put my mouse over a section of the page, I get a different menu. And notice how quickly that happens. That happens instantaneously. Therefore, in the model that we described where you request a page from a web server and it sends it back to you, it doesn't seem like this fits into that model. Right, because normally when you request a page, a little bit of time for that page to load, right? Depending on how much stuff's on the page. Whereas here, this happens instantaneously. I put my mouse over that, boom, that appears. I put my mouse over that. So it doesn't seem like it's going back to the web server and asking for a brand new page. All right. Really what it's doing is it's simply showing and hiding stuff that's already there. So in other words, when we download this page, we download all the visible content, but we also download some invisible content as well. We actually download all these menus and this and anything else that mouses over. All right, but they're set to invisible. How do you think they're set to invisible? P pardon me? What, what, well, well, let me ask you this. In what language do you think they're set as invisible? Well, they're set to invisible in CSS. The JavaScript changes it to visible and then changes it back to invisible. So. JavaScript can be used to change any HTML or CSS property. So you can define in your HTML and CSS how the page looks initially. So the HTML and CSS says this is how the page looks. All right. There are pieces of this page that are invisible. And those get changed to be visible when the user takes an action like this. Really can add a lot to a site, JavaScript can. All right? I just realized I sounded like Yoda there. All right? Uh, but it can add a lot to a website. Uh, it adds kind of interactivity to a website. And we'll spend, um, we, we won't cover JavaScript completely, but we'll at least introduce you to the capabilities of JavaScript so that. If you want to continue on and learn more about it, you'll at least have the fundamentals uh, of it. There are other courses, of course, in the web development uh, series. There is mobile web development, which is an important course where we talk about more techniques to make your page mobile, uh, optimized for mobile. And there's a scripting class where we talk about both client and server-side scripting. All right. That's all I had for today. We're going to end early for once this semester. Um, we'll see you up in lab.